It's a classic military operation. Attack the enemy with overwhelming force. Burn the eye wall. Cut off his ability to communicate. Take the enemy's eyes out. Take his ears out. Then fix him so you can't maneuver. This whole place is going underwater. But this is no sneak attack. The aggressor announces her intentions. Experts predict the date, the time, even the place where she will strike. And yet somehow, a natural disaster spirals into an unnatural human catastrophe. We're devastated. We haven't eaten in three days. What turns Katrina into one of the deadliest hurricanes of modern times? No water, no food. We don't have a home. We lost everything. Welcome back. <laughs> Why does it take so long to respond to the cries for help? Who makes the decisions and why? People gotta do something, they ain't got no more food. We got babies out here, we got handicapped people. Two sons. On the floor, she's dying right now. Two people died already. Where's the people? Where's the mail? Please, somebody. We need some help out here. Get out of here, we walking out of here. I don't even know if my kids are alive, man. The facts behind the storm shed new light as we go inside Hurricane Katrina. Baton Rouge, Louisiana, July 2004. A war game is underway at the state's emergency operations center. The scenario, a deadly hurricane called PAM ravages New Orleans and the surrounding area. Floodwaters surge over the levees engulfing the city. The death toll, 61,000. The injured and sick, 380,000. The homeless, half a million. Half a million buildings destroyed. One million people evacuate the hurricane zone. In the war game, Pam cripples local and state government. So without even waiting for an SOS, Washington takes charge of the relief effort. After a week of these doomsday scenarios, the disaster officials have a preliminary plan. So the locals knew what their responsibilities were. The state knew what its responsibilities were. The federal government knew what its responsibilities were. Wednesday, August 24th, 2005, 11 a.m., the central Bahamas. Heavy rain and high winds rattle the skies and kick up mountainous waves in the Atlantic Ocean. Satellite photography reveals a spinning formation of thunderstorms with the signature counterclockwise rotation of a hurricane in the making. Sustained wind speed tops 38 miles an hour. It is officially a tropical storm for now. On the alphabetized list of names for storms in the Atlantic Ocean in 2005, the next one up is Katrina. Miami. The National Hurricane Center issues an advisory. Hurricane conditions are possible in South Florida within 36 hours. Bentonville, Arkansas. An emergency response team here is already on the case. Hurricanes are one of the few disasters that give you lead time. That you can really kind of plan things ahead of time. And for us, it's go, 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 go until the hit storm hits. This response team is using that lead time to gather truckloads of supplies that people need in an emergency including bottled water, flashlights, and Pop-Tarts. But Jason Jackson is not part of a government disaster plan. He works for Walmart. Thursday, August 25th, 3.30 p.m. Katrina's wind speed hits 74 miles an hour. 
That means she's now a category one hurricane, able to topple trees, down power lines, and damage homes. At the high end of the scale, a Cat 5, with winds above 155 miles an hour, can decimate entire communities, killing anyone in its path. Six thirty p.m. Hurricane Katrina comes ashore. She pummels the coast of Florida and heads inland. She leaves fourteen people dead and causes four hundred sixty million dollars in damages. For a Cat One, she packs a serious punch. The reason? Katrina's swirling winds are high, but she moves over the state slowly at only eight miles per hour. An average hurricane usually moves at about 15 to 20 miles per hour uh, with, with its forward speed. So it basically hung over Florida for an extended period of time, exposing them to relatively weak but hurricane force winds nevertheless. Katrina's foray into South Florida has cost her energy. Hurricanes typically lose strength over land. That's because they draw their power from warm water, like an engine burning fuel. Once she's out over the warm Gulf of Mexico, Katrina re-energizes. The conditions were very ripe because the sea surface temperatures were over 80 degrees, which is the minimum you need for, for the formation of hurricanes. Friday, August 26, 11.30 a.m. Katrina strengthens. She's now a Category 2 hurricane and could become a three within the next 24 hours. Her next target, anywhere from the Florida Panhandle to Louisiana. Along the Gulf Coast, the Red Cross and Salvation Army are on the move. They open shelters and mobile feeding units. So before the storm hits, we're, we're moving people, and we're also moving our supplies. We, we pre-position our supplies in, in warehouses uh, around the Gulf Coast. The news about Katrina is spreading, but who's paying attention? Have you ever been to New Orleans? It's the hottest city. New Orleans, Louisiana. A uniquely American city. A rollicking mix of French, Spanish, Creole, Cajun, and African influences. A place with its own beat. A city of a half a million people spiced with jazz, voodoo, and gumbo. The good times roll on the very fragile soil of the Mississippi Delta. This major port city is built almost entirely below sea level. It's shaped like a crescent and surrounded by water. The Gulf of Mexico, 100 miles to the south, Lake Pontchartrain to the north, and the Mississippi River winds through it. On average, the city streets are six feet lower than the Gulf. It's protected by one of the world's largest systems of earthen levees and flood walls. But some of the levees are slowly sinking and in need of repair. On Friday at 5 p.m., Katrina is northwest of the Florida Keys. With every passing hour, she sucks in energy from the warm water. She's projected to grow into a very dangerous Category 3 hurricane with winds up to 130 miles per hour. Katrina now appears to have settled on a target west of the Florida Panhandle. She is fast becoming a monster. From Washington, D.C. to Louisiana, local, state, and federal officials know Katrina is coming. We're dealing with uh, Hurricane Katrina. Baton Rouge. Here at the Louisiana Emergency Operations Center, officials are in battle mode. Several times a day, they strategize on the phone with emergency planners around the state, the ones who will be on the front lines if disaster strikes. One local official recorded these calls and provided them to the producers of this documentary. They reveal what officials say to each other and how they plan up to the very moment that Katrina strikes. Would like to point out or, or let you know too that the governor is monitoring the call. Will I go to state police? 
Well, there are no road closures at this time. Uh, we've prepared uh, all of our our assets for deployment and uh, placed all our personnel on standby. For this hurricane, as with every natural disaster in the U.S., local and state officials are the primary and most critical line of defense. Shelter Task Force, any reports at this time? Uh, no report, we're just in the alert phase. Red Cross is opening a forward operations office tomorrow morning here in Baton Rouge to begin to stage resources from other states coming in that would be available to support Louisiana and our neighboring states in case of the uh, storm coming in. Everything starts from the bottom up, and there's an old saying, all disasters are local. Even before a hurricane hits or flood waters rise, the states will often ask the federal government to get involved. That's where FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, comes in. FEMA is supposed to strategize with the state and come up with a plan of attack. The state kind of acts as the broker, coordinating what the local needs are and giving us a, a picture of what the, the gross needs are, so to speak. Also on this Friday, August 26th, both Mississippi and Louisiana declare states of emergency, which give the governors the right to deploy National Guard troops and suspend civil liberties. The U.S. Coast Guard puts helicopters, planes, and cutters on standby. Out in the Gulf, oil companies evacuate their rigs. The work stoppage will have an immediate impact nationwide. The Gulf accounts for more than 25% of America's oil and natural gas production. New Orleans is by far the biggest city in the likely path of Katrina. She's now expected to hit the Gulf Coast in 72 hours. Over the coming days, two Louisiana politicians will play leading roles in determining the city's fate. 49-year-old Ray Nagin is a former cable TV executive elected as mayor in 2002. 62-year-old Kathleen Blanco is a veteran of state politics and the first woman to serve as Louisiana governor. It's Friday night in the French Quarter. On Bourbon Street, the étouffée flies out of the kitchens and the freewheeling jazz bands are moving feet. People down here, they don't fear hurricanes. They honor them. Big Easy style with a mind-numbing concoction called a hurricane. 11 p.m. Friday night. The National Hurricane Center forecasts that Katrina will hit land here in the town of Burris, Louisiana, 60 miles southeast of New Orleans. This prediction will turn out to be extraordinarily accurate. Saturday, August 27, 2005. Katrina is now a deadly Category 3 hurricane. Her winds hit 115 miles an hour. She draws awesome power from the Gulf and propels a storm surge ahead of her. 7.30 a.m. Baton Rouge. A Louisiana emergency official, Jeff Smith, has gathered his counterparts for another conference call. FEMA, FEMA Region 6, do you have any comments? The FEMA liaison wants Louisiana officials to make a key decision about relief supplies. We need to start flowing commodities uh, to supplement what we already have, uh, ice water, we need to talk about um, uh, how many uh, distribution points you want. So at your convenience this morning, if you give me a time, we'll give you a call to, to talk about that. Evacuations are underway this morning in low-lying areas south and east of New Orleans. Under the state's emergency plan, those counties, or parishes as they call them in Louisiana, are the first to evacuate because they're the most vulnerable. The policy is very simple. It's get out of here, and get out of here as quickly as we possibly can. So all the state agencies, the local agencies, everybody is working together to accomplish that goal. It's a kind of gentleman's agreement. The goal is to let people in the surrounding communities get out of harm's way before traffic from New Orleans clogs up the interstates. 
For the city, the process begins at the point when forecasts say the tropical storm force winds will hit the coast in 30 hours. That point is approaching this afternoon. 1.30 p.m. This is not a test. This is the real deal. And I don't want to panic you. But I in accordance with this plan, New Orleans Mayor Ray Nagin urges people in the lowest lying areas within the city to evacuate. So we want you to be ready. We want you to be safe. And most importantly, like the governor said, we want you to be calm. The mayor also announces that he will open the Superdome the following morning, Sunday, as a shelter of last resort. The Superdome is a 70,000-seat stadium and home to the New Orleans football team, the Saints. It was built to withstand 200-mile-an-hour winds. By late Saturday afternoon, both Louisiana and Mississippi trigger their emergency highway evacuation plans using all lanes for outbound traffic. Even with the extra roadways, traffic snarls. It's extremely hard to leave. Your whole life is here, your whole world, and it's hard to decide what's important and what's of value. All along the Gulf Coast, thousands of people are streaming inland, hoping to avoid Katrina's wrath. Hotels book up. Lines form at grocery stores and gas stations. Just recently gotten out of a gas line that was about two or three hours, and most of the gas stations are closed down. But there are tens of thousands of people who are just staying put. The people I talked to and asked them to get out, they were like, well, we don't have any place to go, so we're just hanging in here. That attitude pervades parts of New Orleans as well. And this city of nearly half a million people is unprepared to deal with the consequences of so many people who decide to stay in their homes and ride out what threatens to be one of the most dangerous hurricanes in American history. Saturday afternoon, August 27, 2005. A possibly catastrophic hurricane is now forecast to slam into the Gulf Coast on Monday morning. One statistic reveals the tragedy about to unfold. According to the New Orleans Emergency Management Plan, roughly 100,000 residents of New Orleans, more than 20% of the entire city, do not have cars or other means of personal transportation. Many of these same people have no money for a bus, a train, or a hotel. Many depend on welfare checks, which tend to run out by these last few days in the month. Despite the dollars that tourists bring to the Big Easy, New Orleans has long been poor. It has a poverty rate of more than 23%, almost twice the national average. And its murder rate is one of the highest per capita in the country. Many of the city's poorest residents live here, in the sprawling Ninth Ward. People live in ramshackle housing that sits as much as four feet below sea level. Crawford, Texas. President Bush is on vacation today at his ranch. He receives and signs a request from Governor Kathleen Blanco to declare a federal state of emergency in Louisiana. The White House can now direct any federal agency to use its resources to help the area. Saturday evening. FEMA has dispatched five search and rescue teams to Shreveport, Louisiana and Meridian, Mississippi. FEMA positions the teams totaling 262 people out of the line of fire, but close enough to perform rescue operations after the storm hits. FEMA headquarters, Washington, D.C. An emergency specialist and union president named Leo Bosner is also tracking Katrina. Bosner believes the agency is unprepared for the kind of disaster predicted in the Hurricane Pam scenario. And as this went along Saturday night and into Sunday, I think all of us just felt this, this terrible, hollow feeling. Why aren't greater measures being taken? The director of FEMA is 50-year-old Michael Brown. 
He's been running it since 2003 and has handled disasters including California wildfires and the Columbia Space Shuttle explosion. FEMA is not the organization it once was. After 9-11, as the country focused on preventing another terrorist attack, Congress voted to downgrade FEMA from a cabinet-level agency. In 2003, it became part of the new Homeland Security Department. The problem with putting FEMA into the Office of Homeland Security was that it took it out of the White House. And there is nothing more uh, effective for any government agency than being right next to the president. Saturday, August 27th, 7 p.m. Central Time. Katrina is a dangerous Category 3 hurricane. She's barreling toward Louisiana and Mississippi on her way to becoming a cataclysmic four or five. Weather maps show Katrina expanding so rapidly that she seems to overwhelm the entire Gulf. Her 12-foot waves are already approaching parts of the coast. By this point, across New Orleans, floodgates are closing on the levees that surround and cut through the city, including the Industrial Canal on the city's east side, the 17th Street Canal on the west side, and the London Avenue Canal in the Gentilly neighborhood. The levees are embankments made of dirt. Some are topped with reinforced concrete flood walls. They range between 13 and 18 feet tall. Some date all the way back to the 1920s. The Army Corps of Engineers maintains them and acknowledges that budget shortfalls have prevented urgently needed repairs. The levees are built to protect New Orleans from the storm surge of a Category 3 hurricane. Storm surge is when high winds push massive amounts of water above the normal sea level. As thousands of people stream out of New Orleans on Saturday night, jazz trumpeter Kermit Ruffins is headed back in. He's just finished a gig in San Diego. I said, man, I need to get home real quick and board up my windows and get my family together and get out of here. Ruffins is not quite ready to evacuate. He secures his house, then heads to the French Quarter to bar hop. Bars are packed. Saw a lot of friends and real typical New Orleans um, humor. Hey man, this place will be underwater tomorrow. President Bush declared a pre-hurricane state of emergency. 9.30 p.m., Louisiana Governor Blanco joins the conference call with emergency officials. She reports on her latest conversations with FEMA. The FEMA officials tell me that, um, that this is very unusual, that a president has, hasn't done this since 1992, so it's been years. I think that indicates uh, the concerns at the highest levels of government in this nation. And yet, despite the warnings and doomsday scenarios, a FEMA report will later note that on Saturday night, August 27, 2005, the bars were rocking in the French Quarter. After midnight, as the Big Easy slowly winds down, Hurricane Katrina proves the forecasters correct. Sunday, August 28, 12.40 a.m., Katrina becomes a Category 4 hurricane, hell-bent on destruction. Hurricane Pam is no longer just another doomsday theory. The worst-case scenario will soon be reality. Sunday, August 28, 2005, 7 a.m. Central Time. Hurricane Katrina is 250 miles out in the Gulf of Mexico. She has become an extremely rare Category 5 monster, forecast to come ashore in less than 24 hours. At this point, New Orleans Mayor Ray Nagan decides to announce a mandatory evacuation of the city, something that's never been done before. He puts the plan in motion. Baton Rouge, Louisiana. We'll now go to our parish reports, Orleans. On a conference call with state and FEMA officials, 
the New Orleans representative voices one overriding concern. And we're dealing with our internal transportation plan of, of how to deal with our large number of people without vehicles to, uh, to get to a refuge of last resort. 8 a.m., the refuge of last resort, the Superdome, begins taking in evacuees. Behind the scenes, FEMA Director Michael Brown expresses frustration that a mandatory evacuation has not yet been announced. Brown appeals to New Orleans residents. Voluntary evacuations right now. I'll tell you this personally. If I lived in New Orleans, I'd be getting out of there. Crawford, Texas, 9.25 a.m. From his ranch, President Bush calls Governor Kathleen Blanco to discuss the New Orleans evacuation plan. At this point, the governor and the mayor have the power and the responsibility for getting people out of harm's way. New Orleans, 9.30 a.m. President Bush called and uh, told me to share with all of you that he is very concerned about the citizens. He is concerned about the impact that this hurricane would have on our people. And he asked me to, to please um, ensure that there would be a mandatory evacuation of New Orleans. Now there is one. Katrina's landfall is about 20 hours away. This is going to be an unprecedented event. We want everybody to get out. Uh, the city of New Orleans has never seen a, a hurricane of this strength to hit it almost directly. Mayor Nagan also imposes a 6 p.m. curfew. 10, 11 a.m. The National Weather Service issues an apocalyptic advisory, the kind of warning it would seem positively suicidal to ignore. Devastating damage expected. Most of the area will be uninhabitable for weeks, perhaps longer. At least one half of well-constructed homes will have roof and wall failure. All windows will blow out. Airborne debris will be widespread. Persons, pets, and livestock exposed to the winds will face certain death if struck. By this point on Sunday morning, most people have either fled New Orleans or are in the process of doing so. But tens of thousands of people, many in the lowest lying and poorest parts of the city, are not leaving. They scramble to grab last minute supplies. We've got oil, we've got water, we've got food. Pray for us, pray for all of New Orleans. They'll tell you, well, I lived here through Betsy or Camille or one of the previous hurricanes. There have been all kinds of hurricanes that have come through. None of them could truly devastate the area. With a police force of only 1,600, the mayor does not send his officers out to enforce the mandatory evacuation. It's not just a question of manpower. There is also a traditional bias against forcing people out of their own homes. Still, officers do use their powers of persuasion. I went as far as telling people, I said, well, just do me a favor, make life easy on us. Take a permanent marker, write your social security number along one arm and one leg. So when we find your body, we can check the social security records and find out who you are. That we don't have to try and fingerprint a decomposed body. Mayor Nagan dispatches a passenger train leaving the city. The predictions about Katrina are so ominous that National Hurricane Center Director Max Mayfield not only briefs FEMA Director Michael Brown and Homeland Security Chief Michael Chertoff, but also President Bush. Louisiana State Representative Arthur Morell and his wife, Cynthia, a New Orleans City Councilwoman, argue about whether to evacuate. The, he and my son did not want to leave. They were gonna ride out the hurricane. And I said, oh no. Jazz trumpeter Kermit Ruffins has already boarded up his house. Now he and his fiancée consider whether to hit the road. Normally I would stay home, you know, and board up my windows, light a few candles and relax for a day or two. But um, my fiancée said, Kermit, we better get out of here. Elsewhere, people stand on street corners, holding a few spare possessions, bags of clothes or pillows. It's 91 degrees and humid as they wait for buses to take them to the Superdome. The process takes hours. 
When they arrive, they find a shelter with security, medical facilities, food, and water. Between them, FEMA and the Louisiana National Guard have trucked in tens of thousands of liters of water and MREs, or meals ready to eat, the standard military ration. By nightfall, nearly 10,000 people take shelter here. I think the people in here are, are pretty happy to be inside. Indeed, I'm very grateful for this Superdome, because without it, I don't know where we would have went. By now, FEMA has mapped out 11 storage sites in and around the hurricane zone. They have stockpiled supplies, more than two and a half million liters of water, more than 1.3 million MREs, and 17 million pounds of ice. 6 p.m., curfew time in New Orleans. The French Quarter is empty. It's warm, quiet, and calm. The news reports tonight all say the same thing. Katrina is barreling across the Gulf of Mexico at Cat 5 strength, the highest ranking. In the world of weather, this is the weapon of mass destruction. This is uh, pretty much the hurricane that we always talk about. If it should stay on that current trajectory, just east of downtown New Orleans, that's bad. They avoid the direct hit from the south, but look, on the east side, that's the worst flooding scenario. Next is FEMA. 9.30 p.m., Louisiana and FEMA officials hold one more conference call before Katrina strikes. The tone of the call is professional, matter of fact. But it seems the state and FEMA are still pinning down some basic details. FEMA DSS-6 here. We would like to get some additional physical addresses for the general population shelters across Louisiana. I did send an email down to Kitty. The National Weather Service gives a dire flooding report. Yeah, you're pretty much going to have storm surge values around 18 to 19 feet outside your, your uh, levee system. So that's going to cause you overtopping, probably both your federal levees and your parish levees. That's going to be an issue. There will be major overtopping in your area. Monday, August 29th, 2 a.m. Central Time. Katrina starts to lose energy as she nears land and hits shallow water. She weakens to a Category 4 or possibly a 3. Her leading edge is now lashing at towns along the coast of Louisiana and Mississippi. Her winds roar through dark neighborhoods. At least a million people have moved out of harm's way. But along the Gulf Coast, many people are riding out the storm in century-old homes, scattered shelters, and the Superdome. This is where they will stay. Katrina is here. Time has run out. Monday, August 29th, 2005. The nightmare is real. The brutal assault of Katrina begins. 4 a.m. Central Time. Katrina's monstrous winds push a storm surge of 14 to 17 feet toward the Louisiana coast. 5.02 a.m. Parts of New Orleans lose electricity. The Superdome goes dark. The structure has backup generators, but they run only reduced lighting. About 10,000 people here inside the dome listen as the air conditioning system shutters to a halt. Most of the evacuees remain calm. Everybody nice, they fed us, and uh, we just waiting till we ride the storm out. 6.10 a.m. Katrina storms ashore in Plaquemines Parish, Louisiana, 60 miles southeast of New Orleans. Our account of how the hurricane now decimates the city is based on the first comprehensive analysis of the events by the Louisiana State University Hurricane Center. First, the gargantuan storm surge pushes up the Mississippi River. 
It also races here into the Mississippi River Gulf Outlet and here through Lake Bourne, converging in this area known as the Funnel. In New Orleans, the winds are furious. A few hundred feet from the Superdome, two brothers, both police SWAT team members, Dwayne and Daryl Sherman, have spent the night sleeping in their trucks. We just left the doors open, we're sleeping on the, my brother on the back seat of his truck, me on the back seat of mine. And when we heard the wind picking up, it actually sounded like somebody beating on the steel doors. Doug Keesling professional storm chaser sets up his camera and starts recording. I just had like cat three or cat four winds going through these buildings here just ripping off stuff. Evacuees in the Superdome hear a heart-rending noise. Uh, it looks like one section of uh, the Superdome uh, roof may soon uh, peel away uh, from the actual stadium. We're going to uh, go now to Governor Blanco. Reports that we have gotten from people in the dome tell us that there has been <clears throat> um, a, a portion of the roof that is leaking. Water pours into the stadium. Katrina's winds tear at the roof as she rips away 15 foot long sections. On the streets, a man struggles to stand in the blinding rains and relentless winds. 7 a.m., with the eye of the hurricane still south of the city, the storm surge tops the levees in the funnel. St. Bernard Parish begins to flood on both sides of the intracoastal waterway. So does the Lower Ninth Ward in New Orleans. Here, all along the Industrial Canal, Katrina's floodwaters now overtop the levees. Water starts cascading into the city, flowing from the canal both east and west. 7.30 a.m. We'll now go to our parish reports. Uh, please give us your status. It's the first chance for local, state, and FEMA officials to report to each other on Katrina's assault. Power down in the city. Uh, 911 down. The uh, phone systems are, are all down, so we're talking on cell. Uh, we're uh, extensive flooding in the uh, in the east. And, uh, uh, we okay in the Superdome? Can they verify the water in the the ninth ward, industrial canal? Got uh, major tidal surge coming up that intercoastal uh, waterway in the in the uh, East New Orleans, uh, and we also getting some uh, pushback uh, coming up the canal. Inside the Superdome, terrified evacuees are still watching as Katrina continues to tear away at the roof. Right over the 50-yard line, a big chunk of the roof tore off. Can my suddenly, all of a sudden, just scared everybody, scared me. I didn't know what was going to scare Suddenly, bam, unexpectedly. Oh, I can't. I can look at it. I can't. At that point, nobody knew if the building was going to hold. 7.45 a.m. By now in the Lower Ninth Ward, the storm surge has begun to erode the earthen levees. Along the eastern side of the Industrial Canal, the levees now suffer an explosive break. The Lower Ninth Ward and New Orleans East flood rapidly. The flood waters reach to 12 feet above sea level, completely submerging many homes. The flooding in East New Orleans accelerates as the storm surge begins to overtop the levees on Lake Pontchartrain. The city is going under. At this moment, storm chaser Doug Keesling is driving through downtown New Orleans. He meets a man who knows more about the flood consuming the city than the reporters on the scene. How you doing, man? I had to leave out of my house, man. I don't know whether that water's coming over that levee or what. I don't, the last I heard, it's not. So you haven't heard about that water coming over that levee from the lake? No, and check it out. Cause the water started rising so high on my two-story apartment, I had to get out. Back on the conference call in Baton Rouge, 
the emergency director for St. Bernard Parish, asks the state official, Jeff Smith, for emergency supplies. I also need that water and uh, MREs as soon as possible. We've got those requests as well, and as soon as we can work them, we'll, we'll be getting them to you. 10 a.m. Katrina now whirls north and slightly east and delivers a direct strike near the Louisiana-Mississippi border. She decimates towns including Slidell, Louisiana, as well as Waveland, Bay St. Louis, Pass Christian, Gulfport, and Biloxi, Mississippi. We're in uh, Gulfport, right on the coast. Other storm chasers here describe the scene. We got a big storm surge coming in now. Uh, these roads are going to be completely, we're not going to be able to drive in another hour. Well, we had to make it back to the uh, hotel. Uh, let's take a look outside and see what we got here. Well, there's the Gulf of Mexico right there, coming into our parking lot. Man, and we're still about an hour, hour and a half away from the worst winds. Water's coming in, in the room. Oh, man. It comes in wherever he turns. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Storm surge. These men help an elderly woman escape the rapidly rising water. Well, we're in the lobby here of our hotel. We're completely underwater in this first store here. There's a... Uh, Chairs floating by. The enormous surge lifts up this car and rams it into the lobby doors. Jim, look at this over here. It's time to head to higher ground. We're currently on the second floor. The surge chases people up the stairs. I think the eye is very close. Mayor of Gulfport, Mississippi, Brent Guar, is at his mother's house. On his two-way radio, he monitors police dispatch. And you can hear the anguish in their voice. And, and, and I, all I could do is sit there and listen to it, you know, hour after hour. And then finally the lady said, you know, they were swimming for it. And I don't know whether they... I don't know whether they survived or not, you know. Biloxi, Mississippi. Mayor A.J. Holloway is in City Hall with his family. He watches Katrina's merciless assault on his city. And then we look down towards the beach, and all of a sudden we see this, these big waves coming. And they were just coming, and one right behind the other one. And then we started seeing debris washing up. And we started seeing parts of buildings, and I could recognize the buildings. I knew where they were. I knew what they, what they looked like. Then we see furniture floating all around. And... Oh, there goes the house! The house is floating away! And we started seeing cars floating by. And of course, tin off the buildings and, and uh, shingles, just sort of like the Wizard of Oz, you know? Heading further east, Katrina swallows Mobile, Alabama, submerging some parts of the city in as much as 10 feet of water. Back in New Orleans, Katrina is keeping her worst nightmare for last, as her winds push the storm surge against the levees on Lake Pontchartrain. And yet, at the very moment that New Orleans is drowning, journalists here are unaware of the catastrophe unfolding elsewhere in the city. Unwittingly, their live reports give the rest of the country a false sense of comfort. They dodged the bullet, but they still uh, got a, a sound uh, bruising. New Orleans, Monday, August 29th, 10 a.m. The Jackson Barracks, downriver from the French Quarter. Katrina's floodwaters surround 337 National Guard troops. 
it was 14, 15 feet high in the armory in just in, in less than an hour. You could physically just sit there and watch it inch by inch going up the walls of the armory. You could hear pieces of the roof ripping off, glass breaking. We have huge brick walls around our armory and you know as the water came up with, with, the, with the hurricane you could just see them toppling. In homes across the city, the water forces people to move to higher floors. Angela Green and Chris Erskine are in their home in the mid-city neighborhood. We were in a single-story uh, duplex, you know. I mean, it came up to our steps probably within the first hour, and then uh, uh, probably came up further into the house within the next two hours. I had to uh, axe through into our neighbors. Draw a wall. Right, and then get whatever perishables we could because ours were running out. And then we had to swim about 40 feet and get into another neighbor's house to get upstairs to the second floor. If the waters rose high enough in your home, the potential is you drowned in your attic if you couldn't break your way out. Baton Rouge, FEMA Director Michael Brown contacts Homeland Security Chief Michael Chertoff in Washington. Brown wants 1,000 temporary relief workers moved into the hurricane zone within 48 hours. FEMA has about 3,000 employees. Because it's not a first responder, it doesn't have ambulances, fire trucks, or helicopters of its own. The agency relies on state workers, the National Guard, private contractors, the U.S. military, and other federal agencies. Brown orders emergency workers to wait until federal, state, and local officials establish a unified command structure, standard FEMA protocol. Swording through that in the fog of war it can be very difficult because it's the very time when it's the hardest to do that, to, to be able to say, hey, whoa, slow down here, let's, let's work through this. You know, the, they don't want to hear that. You know, the, the state's left with the difficult task of trying to figure out, well, what is it that we can do to meet that need versus what we're going to go and ask uh, the federal government to provide. Katrina knocks out most communication systems. Phones are out. TV and radio stations cannot broadcast. Even satellite communication is unreliable. To meet the first responders victims. A three-star Army General Russell Honore will receive orders later today to oversee the military response to Hurricane Katrina. And when the first responders become victims, they have a challenge in communicating and coordinating. The worst blow from Hurricane Katrina is about to hit New Orleans. Her eye is now northeast of the city. As her winds swirl counterclockwise, she pushes a colossal storm surge up and over the levees here on the south side of Lake Pontchartrain. Storm turns this way. It pushed all that water back in this direction, forcing it into these canals, into the intercoastal waterway. Flood waters race into both the 17th Street and London Avenue canals. The levee walls here along the London Avenue canal start to creak and bend outward. Then near the Mirabeau Avenue bridge, the walls on the east side of this canal collapse. Floodwaters cascade into the city. 10.30 a.m., the levee wall along the west side of the London Avenue Canal now fails. So does the eastern levee on the 17th Street Canal near the old Hammond Highway Bridge. That breach sends floodwaters into the western portion of Orleans Parish. The average home in New Orleans is drowning in six to nine feet of standing water. Everything was damaged. I didn't see one thing that was not damaged. One house, one business. Uh, I particularly noticed that almost every roof was damaged. And I knew at that point we had a big problem. Rescuers are now heading out into the floodwaters. Among them, New Orleans police officers Dwayne and Daryl Sherman. We started receiving reports from there was just hundreds and hundreds of people stranded in attics and on roofs. New Orleans Times-Picayune photographer Alex Brandon joins the Sherman brothers and documents the search and rescue mission. 
we decided at that point to make our way down. We had to take a chainsaw and the entire SWAT team to clear a path because of all the oak trees that were down. There's already people in inside their root in their attics yelling for help. At that point, you're saying to yourself, and you're looking at what you know when you used to patrol as the lower ninth ward was now a lake. It just so happened it was full of houses. And you said, this is gonna be bad. We pulled up to a roof to rescue a young man, and he, he waved us off and said, look, I'm fine, but there's some old people in that house right there. And as we pulled up, there was a, a, an elderly couple, I would guess they were probably in their 70s in a single-story dwelling. Throughout the day, the Shermans, along with Brandon, go from house to house to rescue the young, the old, and the poor. I'd take a picture and then I'd set the camera down and I'd help the person in the boat. I'd take a picture and I'd set the camera down and help the person in the boat. These poor people, they, they, their strength is gone. Gratitude is immediate. At one point, Brandon photographs entertainer Fats Domino moments after his rescue from his house. General Honoré regards Katrina as a worthy adversary. What this storm did was a classic military operation. The storm gathered strength, attacked the coast of Louisiana, Mississippi with overwhelming force. One of the things that a military attack you'd want to do is to cut the enemy's ability to communicate. It took out all cell phone and regular phone services. The other thing this storm did is it cut the road network. It's totally flooded out down there. As this storm moved north, it protected its left flank by leaving a flood. Yeah, it's up. This whole place is going underwater. Again, classic military attack. Take the enemy's eyes out take his ears out. Then fix him so he can't maneuver. Katrina has declared war on... They dodged the bullet, but they still uh, got a, a sound uh, bruising. The media were what people relied on back in Washington to get a picture of what was going on there. And when the report was that everything looked okay on uh, Monday afternoon, that's the impression that was conveyed back in Washington. To the east, once Katrina passes, the damage is shocking. Off the coast of Mobile, Alabama, Katrina has rattled this oil platform from its mooring. Biloxi, Mississippi, a 911 dispatcher is talking to a hurricane victim. We're going to get you out of there. You need to calm down now. like to drown in my house. My house is totally gone. The floating gambling barges in Biloxi and Gulfport have taken a direct hit. Katrina hurled the Grand Casino in Gulfport 150 yards onto US-90. The region's gambling industry is out of luck. So are many homeowners. We lost everything. I don't even know if my kids are alive, man. I couldn't believe my eyes. Everything was gone. People were just coming out of their homes and the days look on their faces. Their neighbors, in many cases, were, were just gone. Monday afternoon, nature's fury and the politics of disaster are on a collision course. Baton Rouge, Louisiana. FEMA Director Michael Brown reports back to both Homeland Security and the White House. 
The scope of the natural disaster is unprecedented. Relief efforts in New Orleans are uncoordinated. Brown has concluded that Louisiana is incapable of handling the crisis. As night falls, some survivors wade through the brackish water as corpses float by. This evening, an ABC News correspondent on the scene in New Orleans reports that the levees have only overtopped, not broken. It was simply the volume of rain that left many areas underwater, he says. This was not the apocalyptic hurricane that many had feared. Just how wrong such reports are will become abundantly clear over the next 24 hours. Tuesday, August 30th, 2005. As the morning sun illuminates the shattered Gulf Coast, early risers in other parts of the country are greeted with surprisingly good news. A New York Times headline is one of many reports expressing relief. Escaping feared knockout punch barely, it says, New Orleans is one lucky big mess. Here's the real scene Tuesday morning in New Orleans. Flood waters cover 80% of the greater New Orleans area. In the city alone, Katrina has destroyed at least 200,000 homes. Survivors navigate through the city on top of a mattress, in a tub, or on a crude raft. Cars, houses, street signs are all submerged in a muddy brown layer of water, gas, sewage, and chemicals. Thousands of desperate residents are trapped in their homes, chased by the rising waters into attics, breaking through to their rooftops. They wait and pray for help. A depleted police force struggles to come to the city's aid. Police will later report that 249 officers deserted their posts during the hurricane. You know, they left us at the most critical time in this city. Um, it hurt us bad. It really did. And yet, rescue missions are in full swing. Leading the charge, the U.S. Coast Guard, National Guard units, FEMA search and rescue teams, and the Louisiana Department of Wildlife and Fisheries. Even in the midst of a communications blackout, they pluck the stranded off rooftops and motor up to their flooded homes. The floodwaters are still coming in. San Diego, 9 a.m. Pacific time. President Bush sticks to his previously scheduled agenda. He arrives in California from Texas and gives a speech at the Coronado Naval Air Station commemorating the 60th anniversary of the end of World War II. After the speech, a White House spokesman announces that the president is cutting short his vacation and flying back to Washington tomorrow to deal with Hurricane Katrina. New Orleans. Mayor Ray Nagin manages local relief efforts from his command post on the 27th floor of the downtown Hyatt Hotel. In the first 24 hours after the disaster, response time is critical. But officials at the local, state, and federal levels have yet to get a clear picture of the situation. Chaos in the streets is matched by chaos in government. I don't think there was a system for them to push the SOS button, you know, from the state, the city, state, local level that said, we've got a, we've got a big problem here. As rescue workers save people from the floodwaters in 90 degree heat, they bring them here to the Superdome. The stadium is now an island amid the floodwaters. Trucks with fresh supplies of food, water, and medicine cannot approach the building. The crowd inside swells to 20,000 and spills outside as well. Many have now been here for three days. 
Conditions deteriorate by the hour. Toilets back up and overflow. The smell of sewage, sweat, and filth is everywhere. A similar situation is developing one and a half miles away here at the New Orleans Convention Center. The city never planned to use it as an official place of refuge, but today it's becoming a spontaneous shelter for about 25,000 evacuees, including tourists whose hotels were flooded out. There are no emergency supplies in the building, no food, no water, no medicine. Both the Louisiana National Guard and FEMA will later acknowledge that at this point on Tuesday, they were unaware that people were taking shelter here. My mother and my sister has diabetes real bad, so I just wanted them to be safe. Hundreds of other people are stranded on bridges and roadways around New Orleans, without food, water, or shelter. Many will remain exposed to the elements for days to come. It's just disgusting and frustrating, and we, we are human beings, and they're treating us like we're criminals. Throughout the city, chaos reigns. Looters shatter store windows. They cart off everything from food to entire display cases. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, meantime, tries to repair the break at the 17th Street Canal flood wall. They fly in sandbags via helicopter and drop them onto the break. It doesn't work. The bags are too small. The floodwaters carry them off. And New Orleans keeps filling with water. The levees and canal walls, once the city's great protector, now trap the floodwaters inside the city. New Orleans has an extensive pump system to send the floodwaters into Lake Pontchartrain and the Mississippi River. But most are either broken or choked with debris. If this city dies, it's really going to be the things that happen after Katrina. Tuesday night, 10.15 p.m., Governor Kathleen Blanco calls for the full evacuation of the Superdome. With the area around the stadium flooded, transportation will be a slow process. The plan is for buses to carry 20,000 people to the Houston Astrodome and other shelters. We want help! We want help! Help us! Night falls on this second day after Katrina. Tens of thousands of people remain trapped in New Orleans, some on the streets without basic necessities, others in the Superdome and Convention Center. Wednesday will bring full-out chaos, including wild rumors of widespread murder and gang rape. And in a country accustomed to watching its troops swoop into foreign terrain and deliver aid, seemingly at a moment's notice, people are beginning to wonder what's going wrong. Wednesday, August 31st, 2005. Forty-eight hours since Hurricane Katrina slammed into the Gulf Coast. In a typical hurricane, relief efforts might already be under control, but the scale of this disaster is unprecedented. New Orleans. According to FEMA, floodwaters keep its supply trucks from entering the city. FEMA will also later report that over the next several days, it has trouble communicating with local and state officials and, quote, doesn't know where critical help is needed, unquote. In the Superdome, 20,000 evacuees now wait for buses to take them to Houston. When the tsunami happened, when the hurricanes was going on in Florida, they ran over there to help us. Here we in our own town, and they will not give us nothing. 10.40 a.m. President Bush takes off on Air Force One, headed back to Washington. He asks the pilot to fly low over the hurricane zone. Down below, tens of thousands of people pack shelters across three states, all hoping to return home quickly. Many do whatever it takes to get by. Mobile, Alabama. Survivors are salvaging whatever they can, picking through what was once this family's living room. In New Orleans, there's still no electricity. Survivors bake in the sweltering 90-degree heat. No water, no food. No food. 
We got babies out here. We got handicapped people. Yeah, people dying in the building. We're starving out here. We got people that need. General Russell Honore has now arrived in New Orleans to head up U.S. military efforts. The general leaps into action. And I give the president uh, some credit on this. Mayor Ray Nagan tells a radio interviewer that he's pleased with Honore's deployment. He sent one John Wayne dude down here that can get some stuff done. And his name is General Honore. And he came off the doggone chopper. And he started cussing and people started moving. General Honoré regards the crisis here in New Orleans as much more challenging than the one in Mississippi. The big difference is Mississippi didn't have standing water. It didn't have comms, it didn't have roads, but the water went back to sea. In the case of New Orleans, it created this big tub of water right in the city. Relief efforts are still in disarray. Mayor Nagin predicts the death toll in New Orleans alone will be in the thousands. Over the next two days, Louisiana officials begin predicting 10,000 dead. Helicopters carry wounded and sick evacuees here to Louis Armstrong Airport, which is fast becoming a makeshift hospital. I've never seen anything like this before. Everyone's doing the best that they can. As the day wears on, the looting intensifies. Mayor Nagin orders police to stop search and rescue missions and focus on law and order. Some steal to survive. They so said we could come in and get the necessities. I don't have any clothes or nothing. I'm just getting food. Others simply take advantage of the situation. There are too many looters to round up and too few police officers. National Guard troops are not handling law enforcement because Governor Blanco has made search and rescue their top priority. Rumors begin to spread of rampant violence in the Superdome and the Convention Center. Tales of widespread homicide, assault, and gang rapes. The national media report many of the rumors as confirmed facts. Most will turn out to be either false or highly exaggerated. Estimates of 200 dead bodies in the Superdome turned out to be untrue. A total of six people died in the stadium, four of natural causes, one from an overdose and one suicide. Horror stories of mass murder inside the convention center also turn out to be way off the mark. Police recover four bodies, one is a homicide victim. And I love the press. I mean, just at their perspective of what they're seeing in the hearing, then it becomes circular reporting. One person reported was two, the next time you hear it's five. Nonetheless, these two buildings and the anguished people inside them become the public face of an unfolding catastrophe, the kind that most Americans associate more with the third world than with their own country. I don't have home. I had home downtown. But it's gone. It's under the water. I have nothing. Nothing. They have over 3,000 people out of here with no home, no shelter. What are they going to do? What are we going to do? The plight of Katrina's victims touches people all across the country, including this man, the owner of a bus company in a small town outside Minneapolis. He and his friends start a local relief effort collected over 90,000 pounds of food supplies in probably in, a, in about 24 hour period. They caravan down to Louisiana, driving through the night, six buses and a truck. They deliver their food and emergency supplies to hurricane victims in Shreveport and Natchitoches. Bentonville, Arkansas, the Walmart's emergency operations center what started a week ago as an emergency effort to stock its stores has evolved. It's now a cooperative relief effort with the Red Cross in Mississippi and Louisiana. We needed to start sending five trailers a day in to support Jefferson Parish to provide them water, dry food. And I remember there was one load of chainsaws to help cut some of the people out of the buildings. Wednesday afternoon, Washington, D.C. President Bush returns to the White House and convenes a cabinet meeting. 
Bush and his advisors debate whether the federal government should try to take over the relief effort and take command of the Louisiana National Guard. According to published reports, the president calls Governor Blanco on Wednesday to float this idea, but cannot persuade her. In the weeks to come, aides to Blanco acknowledge that the governor spoke to the president on this day, but firmly deny that Mr. Bush made any such offer. It's an issue of control. If she had allowed the president to take over the National Guard, she feared political recrimination. Here again is where politics immediately takes part. Uh, it enters into these considerations. Confusion about who's responsible for what relief effort is a problem reverberating all along the Gulf Coast. FEMA, Red Cross, you know, they got a few feeding trucks into the areas, but the assistance that you would typically think for a storm this magnitude in an area that was so hardly hit, they just didn't show up. New Orleans, Wednesday night. Buses arrive at the Superdome to begin the evacuation. But one group of New Orleans residents is already being evacuated, not by the city, the state, or FEMA. This young man, 20-year-old Jabbar Gibson, commandeers a school bus. He loads it up with people in need of shelter, and off they go to Texas. 10.35 p.m., Gibson arrives at the Houston Astrodome. He deposits his passengers at the newly designated shelter. TV networks replay the footage of Gibson at the wheel. In the midst of a crisis that's overwhelming government at all levels, here at least is a private citizen seizing the moment, acting heroically. But people are wondering, where are the public officials who should be doing the same? Thursday, September 1st, 2005, 7 a.m. Eastern Time. On ABC's Good Morning America, President Bush offers a comment about Hurricane Katrina that kicks up a political dust storm. I don't think anybody anticipated the breach of the levees. Some experts had in fact warned that the levees might fail if a big hurricane swept through New Orleans. The president said he's gonna lead the investigation into what went wrong. He need to look only in the mirror. In God's name, where the people were supposed to give water, support, people were dying there. What in heaven's name was happening? Next target for outrage? the slow evacuation of the Superdome. It will take three days to transport all 20,000 stranded evacuees to Houston and elsewhere. The guys put it on the ground and send these trucks back for another load. Yes, sir. Make that happen now. Yes, sir. Army General Russell Honore is in charge of the transport. To many observers, Honore is the first official on the scene who seems to be actually taking charge. This whole humanitarian thing comes out of logistics. You can't get buses in there because of the water. Then we could get them in there. We had to bring them in two at a time. The Red Cross offers its services in New Orleans, but Louisiana officials will decline the offer. They tell the Red Cross they cannot guarantee their safety and that Red Cross vehicles might disrupt rescue efforts. Mississippi. Getting aid to some hurricane victims is time consuming because the population is so spread out. George W. Bush, get out the White House and come help us. Police ain't help. There's been one Salvation Army truck come by. You know, they set up over there, they stayed there about three hours. They were gone. Help can't come fast enough for New Orleans. Massive sandbags start to plug the hole in the 17th Street Canal to keep floodwaters at bay. National Guard troops now begin to retake the city. Their mission is to go door to door and look for survivors. Kitchen rescue, call out, make a noise, we're here to help. Some of them didn't want to evacuate with us, and we, were, you know, we didn't want to let people back out into the city. We didn't want to have to come in and rescue again in those conditions. 
New Orleans police team up with other rescuers. No bodies in that one. How's we check before his guy dead? He had it. This officer trudges through knee deep water to see if anyone is trapped in. My, 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 my wife's gone. I don't want to talk about it, man. Bureaucracy slows down the relief effort. This group drove 22 hours from Florida. When they arrive, officials ask them to show credentials and sign paperwork. The process takes two days. There was no communication with the right hand to know what the left hand was doing. And we are all organized, we're certified, we got rescue boats, and they told us to sit. And still the relief efforts are stalled. Thousands of people remain stranded at the convention center in horrendous conditions, with no food or water. Garbage overflows onto the sidewalks and streets. The sick, like this man, are carried on gurneys over strewn debris. Excuse my French, everybody in America, but I am pissed. Thursday evening, in a radio interview, Mayor Ray Nagan takes a shot at both state and national officials. We don't do another press conference until the resources are in this city. Now get off your asses and let's do something. And let's fix the biggest goddamn crisis in the history of this country. 11.30 p.m. Eastern Time. FEMA director Michael Brown appears on ABC News Nightline. Ted Koppel asks him about reports that FEMA did not know about the people stranded in the convention center until today. Hey, don't you guys watch television? Don't you guys listen to the radio? Our reporters have been reporting about it for more than just today. We learned about it factually today that that's what existed. We've been so focused on doing rescue and life-saving missions and evacuating people from the Superdome that when we first learned about it, of course, my first gut instinction, uh, instinct was get somebody in there. Koppel also asks Brown why FEMA did not respond faster to Katrina. Uh, when the levees did break, uh, we were already moving in and then had to move back out. And then I think the other thing that really caught me by surprise was the fact that there were so many people, and I'm not laying blame, but either chose not to evacuate or could not evacuate. The explanations might be logical, but in the hurricane zone, the problems are vast and urgent. People are growing furious at the slow pace of the relief efforts. It's still a slow, slow, slow process. Because you got a whole city here, you know what I'm saying? We don't have nothing to go home to. Nothing. Mobile, Alabama. Friday, September 2nd, 2005, 10.35 a.m. President Bush gets his first ground-level look at the devastation of Hurricane Katrina. With FEMA Director Mike Brown at his side, he responds to the growing criticism of federal relief efforts. It's not going exactly right, we're going to make it go exactly right. If there's problems, we're going to address the problems. And, and, that's, and that's what I've come down to assure people. And Brownie, you're doing a heck of a job. The FEMA director's working 24 hours. New Orleans, 12 p.m. Louisiana National Guard troops march into the convention center. Within 30 minutes, they restore order and begin to distribute food and water. Within 36 hours, they evacuate 25,000 people from the building. They're bussed and flown to shelters around the country. 5 p.m., Air Force One touches down at the Louis Armstrong Airport in New Orleans. In his office on the plane, the president meets with both Governor Kathleen Blanco and Mayor Ray Nagan. The mayor later describes the meeting. We're in Air Force One. I say, Mr. President, Madam Governor, you too have to get in sync. If you don't get in sync, more people are gonna die. But the president and the governor do not get in sync. Blanco will reject Bush's proposal for a federal takeover of the relief effort. When the president returns to Washington, he signs the first of many aid packages for hurricane victims. 
Monday, September 5th. Tensions are also building between Governor Blanco and Mayor Nagin. In one interview, the mayor compares the relief efforts of General Honore to those of the state government. And when he hit the field, we started to see action. And what the state was doing, I don't freaking know. Tuesday, September 6th. The Army Corps of Engineers begins pumping water out of New Orleans and back into Lake Pontchartrain and the Mississippi River. We established a separate task force, task force on watering, so that they could focus totally on just uh, pumping out water and getting the pump stations operational. Friday, September 9th, 11 days after Katrina struck, more than half of New Orleans is still underwater. Roughly one million people have evacuated from the hurricane zone. Government agencies and volunteer groups are providing shelter to more than a quarter of a million. Others are living with friends or relatives around the country. In the flooded streets of New Orleans' Araby neighborhood, filthy water laps at second-story windows. You're gonna die, man. I'm telling you, you're gonna die. I don't want you to die, man. I know you. National Guard and FEMA crews search from house to house, trying to clear out the bitter enders who refuse to evacuate. Mayor Nagin has called for everyone to leave the city. He has clashed with Governor Blanco, who insisted the mayor had no authority to enforce such a total evacuation. By now, local, state, and federal forces, as well as volunteers, have performed almost 50,000 rescues. FEMA has delivered 18 million packaged meals and 10 million gallons of drinking water to flood victims. And people all across America have chipped in to help. Y'all have met us in never need, never wait. And we put lives for no more. Donations to groups providing Katrina relief top $1 billion. It's the biggest outpouring since 9-11. Baton Rouge, landline telephone connections are coming back up. For the first time since Katrina hit, Louisiana emergency officials are able to convene a conference call. No FEMA liaison is on the line as local officials unload their frustrations with the agency. We thought we were going to have a meeting with uh, Baton Rouge people, the FEMA people, yesterday. They canceled that one, so I don't know where we are with it, other than it's just creating downright chaos. One of the big gripes has to do with temporary housing. It's FEMA's job to provide it across the hurricane zone. They made commitments to the city of Clyde Elk for 400 uh, trailers. None of us know who the guy was that uh, talked to him, but what his authority was, yeah. so it's, a, it's a mess. State emergency official Jeff Smith says he's taken the problem to a higher level. Well, I flew my top this morning, and I brought that up actually to the vice president last night. So it's, uh, that's unacceptable. So we need to be able to fix the communication problem. And no sense being a FEMA basher here. We're trying to solve problems. We're up here doing, uh, doing the best that we possibly can for you. We're doing for you. The emergency director from Jefferson Parish, Walter Maestri, is angry that FEMA has not fulfilled promises made before the hurricane struck. First and foremost, we have still not received, since the storm, any of our gasoline and diesel shipments. As you recall, on the last conference call before the storm hit, we requested the Gen Pack. Gen Packs are generators. Without them, Maestri cannot operate his parish's sewage system. The matter is going into the street, and we're going to have a medical disaster. I, I don't know what's going on, but not one generator you know, from that, through that system has arrived here. And now when we are on our knees, nothing's available. This same afternoon, Homeland Security Chief Michael Chertoff holds a press conference in Baton Rouge to defend FEMA. Mike Brown has done everything he possibly could. Nevertheless, Chertoff is sending Mike Brown back to D.C. He appoints Vice Admiral Thad Allen, a 34-year Coast Guard veteran, to oversee the FEMA relief effort. Three days later on September 12th, Michael Brown resigns. He leaves behind a tarnished organization. 
and an enormous political problem for the Bush administration. The following week, another hurricane in the Gulf of Mexico gives officials at all levels of government a chance to prove they learned something from Katrina. Let's not get stuck on the last storm. Right now, we're going down Paris Avenue, which is like a major hub going to the lakefront of New Orleans. Most of these are single-family homes. Two weeks after flooding from Hurricane Katrina decimated New Orleans, City Councilwoman Cynthia Morell and her husband Arthur, a state representative, boat through their neighborhood. <laughs> it's my son's car right there, <laughs> the top of it. My Jeep over there. And that's his Jeep. The, the pressure from the water pushed these concrete retainers and the dirt gave way. And then the water just pushed in. Down on the other side, it just fell. Because those rebars and that concrete could not hold all this. It's too heavy. Some of the city's giant pumps have begun to send the floodwaters back into Lake Pontchartrain. People are returning to inspect their homes. As you can see, this used to be a pretty nice block. With the houses, mostly families. All lived here. All of the family. Munley, Kate, Mr. Hamp, Ms. Johnson, Yancey's, Fletcher's. You know, uh, Lange had the barbershop there. City Council President Oliver Thomas visits his neighborhood in the Ninth Ward and the house where he grew up. I said I, that I, all my crime was, was done. But I guess it's not. This is the house my, my father used his GI Bill to buy this house so we wouldn't have to rent. I live with family anymore. As authorities search more neighborhoods in New Orleans, the death toll climbs. Over the next month, it will exceed 1,200 across Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama. The Gulf Coast has lost its battle with Hurricane Katrina. Survivors remain trapped for days, while the most powerful nation on Earth struggled to bring them food and relief. Hardly an inspiring performance, especially in a post-9-11 world. I think that people in this country had a right to believe that the country was being made more safe after September 11th. Everybody dropped the ball on this, there's no question about it. Tuesday, September 13th, President Bush becomes the first top official to accept blame for the Katrina crisis. Katrina uh, exposed serious problems in our response capability at all levels of government. And to the extent that the federal government uh, didn't fully do its job right, I take responsibility. Tuesday, September 20th, another hurricane, Rita, storms into the Gulf. Public officials have a second chance to get it right. Don't get stuck on stupid, reporters. We're moving forward. And don't confuse the people, please. Let's not get stuck on the last storm. Our first mission is to save lives. We have a coordinated federal, state, and local effort moving in place as we speak. The federal government was busy assuring us there had been plans made, people prepositioned, plenty of supplies, water, meals ready to eat. They were determined not to make the same mistake again uh, three weeks later. Saturday, September 24th, Hurricane Rita comes ashore between Johnson's Bayou, Louisiana, and Sabine Pass, Texas. Damage is extensive and dozens of people are killed. But this time, the government seems to have its act together. Uh, select committee will come to order. Washington, D.C. Tuesday, September 27th. Good morning and welcome to this morning's hearing. The recently resigned FEMA director Michael Brown testifies before a House committee. 
Brown places blame for the events in New Orleans squarely at the local and state level. I very strongly, personally, regret that I was unable to persuade Governor Blanco and Mayor Nagin to sit down, get over their differences, and work together. I just couldn't pull that off. My biggest mistake was not recognizing by Saturday that Louisiana was dysfunctional. The very next day, Louisiana Governor Kathleen Blanco appears before a Senate committee, but does not answer Brown's attack. You were criticized yesterday heavily by Mr. Brown. I'd just give you a chance here, if you would, would like to, to, to respond to that. Senator Conrad, I appreciate that, but uh, today I came really to talk about job creation. Monday, October 17th, FEMA has released emails to the House Committee investigating Katrina, and they are leaked to reporters. Michael Brown sent one to a colleague two days before Katrina struck. In it, he alludes to FEMA's 2004 Hurricane Pam war game. Look at this scenario compared to the planning we did for New Orleans, and well, you get the picture. But who did get the picture? Five days after Katrina, another email from a frustrated FEMA official in Mississippi suggests the agency did not. Resources are far exceeded by requirements, he writes, getting less than 25% of what we have been requesting from HQ daily. Katrina has caused Americans to wonder whether the government at any level is prepared to respond to a major disaster or terrorist event in their hometowns. After 9-11, Congress provided billions of dollars for cities and states to improve their evacuation plans. How good would those plans be in a crisis? Take New York City. It depends on its vulnerable public transit system to get people to safety. Or Los Angeles. In the event of a catastrophic earthquake that would require people to flee the city, L.A. has no plan for evacuating millions of people or housing them. I don't see a water line. I may be lucky. Big gray house on the corner. Jazz trumpeter Kermit Ruffins returns home. His house is on relatively high ground and escaped significant damage. To look at that city now is just like, we can't wait to rebuild. I mean, it's all we can think about. That's my baby picture there. Some of my records right here. Nice kitchen back there. Remember those red beans and records? Ruffins then checks out Vaughn's, the neighborhood bar where he's played a Thursday night gig for the last 13 years. I'll tell you one thing, it looks exactly the same. This place will be rolling in no time. All we need is electricity here. Hurricane Katrina has dampened the spirit of the Big Easy, but it has not drowned it. May take a year for it to really start thriving again. We will swing again.